And we are live. Now, today I have a recommendation from a previous guest who's been on multiple times, both by himself and with the behavior panel, Greg Hartley. And Greg could not speak highly enough of Jim Pyle. And it's no wonder that they're close because I read Jim's book. And Greg's name popped up a lot in the book, and Greg wrote the forward. So they're both really close. They both overlap in their skills, but they have different skill sets. And I'm really excited to have you on today, Jim, because you can fix me and help me learn to ask questions. So I'll start with this one. How are you doing today? I'm as good as I can be for as bad as I've ever been, and that's the best I can hope for these days. And uh, glad to be here to uh, share with your your audience today. Awesome. Now, I'm going to start out with a generalized question because I prepped and I said, let me talk to Greg. What should I ask Jim about just a little bit early? He said, ask Jim about his job history. So tell us a little bit about that and where the bodies are buried, neighbor. <laughs> Well, I, uh, I, I look back uh, over 70 years now, and uh, my, my jobs that I think have culminated in my body, life focus uh, probably started uh, back when I was a, uh, a preacher at one point to communicate with uh, uh, people in live audience and uh, and in uh, and, and the religious realm. Uh, so I did that for about seven years and uh, with the Churches of Christ, Christian Churches. And uh, I don't preach anymore, but I still care about people and do what I can do for people. Uh, from there, uh, I went to work in the uh, cemetery funeral home business, which seemed to fit for me uh, for some reason. I'm not sure. I guess I got them ready. Then we took care of them after that. <laughs> you prepped them at church. Yeah, and you and ready to go. Right and ready to go. We, I, I take care of that. But I, I enjoyed my work at, at the Fricky Funeral Home in Lincoln, Illinois. And from there, I went to Southern California and worked for Forest Lawn Memorial Park in Glendale, California. If, if you're familiar at all with Southern California and Forest Lawn, it is it's famous for uh, famous people being buried there and uh, and all but uh, it is the most amazing uh, cemetery experience you can have in that uh, it, it's, it's visited by as many people at one time that would go to Disneyland in a year. And the artwork and, and the churches that are there, uh, they, they have as many weddings, as you can imagine, maybe over 80,000 weddings now so far in the cemetery because it's so beautiful. And the setting okay. is so alive. So it's not ghoulish. It's just no, no, night. no, not at all. It, it's, well, it's, I was going to say, look, 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 it's LA now. Come on. There, there could be a gothic <laughs> thing going. No, no, no. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I worked in the cemetery, had a lot of people under me, and they all looked up to me. It was great. But uh, Forest Lawn Memorial Park is where I began to sell cemetery property, which is something everybody needs, nobody wants. So if you're going to make money, you're going to have to sell well. And to sell you well, know, you have to get information about the people you're talking to. That's actually kind of interesting because, believe it or not, I have a, a viewer who's given me feedback mm -hmm. who has invested in multiple plots. Okay. A, a, as an actual investment. And I was like, well, that's an interesting small scale real estate investment <laughs> idea. <laughs> I, guess, I guess theoretically, the, the plots could go up over time. You, people eventually have to have them, but sure, kind of sure. wild. It, it, it is it is it's a real estate on a different different scale, but uh, but I, I sold cemetery property in Southern right. California for the finest cemetery, for, finest private cemetery in the United States, the most important and wonderful one. Of course, is Arlington. That is that is hallowed ground, but for a private right. cemetery, Forest Lawn Memorial Park, Glendale, was 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 the the the, the, the pinnacle of of of, of a business. Uh, uh, of, of cemetery property. Now I sold cemetery property and then I became a sales trainer because mm. I was successful. And then I became a field trainer, taking other sales people who were new and putting them out in the field and watching them and listening to them and helping them. And my legacy with Forest Lawn Memorial Park, Southern California, Glendale, is that I took a gentleman by the name of Bob Bowker. He wouldn't mind me telling the story. He would, he would allow for that. 
and he had burned out in his previous job. And so he got the, uh, the $600 bonus to come to Forest Lawn, take the training for a week, and then see if he could be a, a salesman for Forest Lawn. And with that, he uh, came to me. The folks from the schoolhouse said, we don't think he's going to make it, but do what you can with him and we'll see how it goes. Bob Bowker made it. I helped him make it. And Bob Bowker turned out to be, three years after I left Forest Lawn, to be the trainer for Forest Lawn of every single trainee salesperson for the next 27 years. Nice. And so I've, I have a legacy with that in that Bob and I were, were one-on-one in his very beginning. And I think I may have helped because I, I helped him to, to learn to listen. And see, that's the thing about questions is it's not so much the questions that's important. It's also the listening. One mm-hmm. mouth, two ears. That's the ratio. Shouldn't be talking more than you're listening. And the questions should make somebody have something to say. So that's why when you ask yes and no questions, you're wasting time and getting no information. And you know that. Uh, you, you've been doing this for a good long while. You ask a question that somebody can make a comment about and then give you information about. And so that's that's what I brought to the Army back in 1984. I brought experience. I was 33 years old. I was an old timer showing up. and uh, But I brought street experience. I brought sales experience. And guess what interrogation is? Sales. It really is mm. sales to get somebody to do something they don't want to do and for them to want to do it. And so, yeah, I think I've that heard was, that, that I, I think I've heard that it is interrogation is selling a product with very limited option. Yeah. <laughs> and are very paint, reluctant. Paint, paint, paint the black picture and poke a little hole in there. And that little bit of light becomes the biggest light you got. But, uh, exactly. but so it is, it, and, and it's not, it's not the, you know, and you, you know, and you've talked to Greg, it's not about all the things you see in the movies. It's really about interacting with people and what motivates people. And when you find that out because you ask good questions, because you elicited well, then you know what to work with. And with that, then the job becomes easy. Now, as it turns out, um, my Army experience, my first uh, assignment after uh, going to language school at Monterey, California, and interrogation school at uh, Fort Huachuca, was at Fort Bragg for uh, a year or two and a half. Two and a half years. And then they sent me to the schoolhouse of Fort Huachuca to become an instructor. And I think that's because I was an older guy and I, I had communicated well. And I think my, my background kept me there. Sure. And I began to then train uh, interrogators at that point. And the Army sent me back three times to Arizona. And I hate the desert. I hate the desert. But uh, I was glad to do what I did. And, and the last time I was there uh, for interrogation training, uh, nobody wanted to teach questioning. It's 40 hours, five days a week, eight hours a day. And the way that it was set up back then, it was mind numbing, 240 uh, slides for questioning and taught the interrogators every question to ask in every situation and every sequence. Mm-hmm. And it just was burdensome, difficult. And when I came out of the Army in 2004 and I worked for Jerry York, the grandson of uh, Alvin York at Phoenix uh, Consulting, uh, they got the very first contract, the only contract that's ever been teaching interrogation to DOD other than the Army Interrogation School and the Marine Interrogation School. And we did that, Cliff Ruggles and I did that for five years. And we wrote the course and we taught the course to Navy SEALs, to Special Ops and Army, uh, the Marines and, 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 and all the services for five years. And it's the only non-military service school that ever was able to have that contract. And so I said to myself, when I began to question, teach questioning, I wanted to do it different. And when I learned to do it different, I taught it different. And it all came down to one little formula because you don't have to know every question to ask. You just have to know how to ask questions. No, that makes a lot of sense. And actually, I've got a question from locals. And I always try to encourage people to follow me at unstructured.locals.com. Mm-hmm. And I will try to you know, take questions from there as a priority as well. 
And to summarize it, it is essentially, when it comes to questioning, I'd love to know if he believes his own true organic life experiences related to a topic or line of questioning with a subject in a com conversational setting have been invaluable to obtaining results. And this is from Holly Owens. And I think it's just essentially, have your life experiences helped you in your endeavors in building rapport with people and being able to talk to them? The answer is yes, but it's also, it's not a requirement because okay. sure. young people don't have the, the life experience that I have, but because human nature is human nature, there's certain things that are just always relatable. And I'll pass along something to, to her and to your listeners uh, that uh, was passed to me and, and I thought was, had value. Uh, I had a, a fellow interrogator said that he thought two things were important to be able to relate to somebody that you'd have nothing to relate about. For instance, uh, any terrorist from any political stance, I don't have anything in common with because I'm not that mind, I don't have that mindset. I don't understand how they think the way they think, but I don't have to be able to do that to talk with them. And he said the two things that he recommends was to watch Seinfeld, the TV show, and the Food Channel. And I said, okay, oh. I, I, I'm, I'm, okay. I'm, you got me here. He said, he said what's the, the, the Seinfeld TV show about? Nothing. Just talking yeah. about anything. He said, you're going to spend a lot of time talking about nothing before you find something. So be aware that you've got to talk, and you've got to listen, and it might not be what you want to talk about before you get to get to what you really want to know. And then the other thing is the Food Channel, because the only thing we have in common sometimes with somebody across the table, or if there's no table at all, with uh, in an interrogation situation, is food. Everybody eats, and everybody has food. Everybody has a favorite food. And so the life experiences I have, I can relate to people when I understand they have similar experiences or I have observations that I've made in life. But if I don't have anything in common with somebody, that doesn't keep me from relating, doesn't keep me from talking, and I'll find right. something some way, somehow. And that was what tripped up Saddam Hussein, was food. Muskoof is a type of uh, grilled carp, and he and I had that in common. I, I'm from southern Illinois, and I'll, oh. eat, you know, I'll eat Mississippi River carp in the spring and the fall, uh, not in the summer, but because uh, I like that myself. Most people don't, but because he would eat that three or four times a week, he was hiding out next to a lake and there's a fisherman in the lake. And if you ask Eric Maddox about that, he wrote the book of uh, Mission, Mission, uh, Mission Blacklist number one, Eric Maddox. He was a student of mine in strategic debriefing school. Mm. And uh, this this food tied to that fisherman tied to, to, to Crete, I think is where he was at, in that little spider hole, is what made the connection. And that's what gave wow. him. So the human nature always is where you want to follow the, the line because you'll find somebody some way. Same way with, uh, same way with uh, Pablo Escobar. I was working at the Pentagon, Counter Drug South America, at the Joint Tactical Intelligence Center, in my mid-career which was quite a uh, circumstance that uh, I was very, very fortunate. Only two Army interrogators are assigned to the Pentagon, and I got to be one of the two. Did you work with um, Javier and Steve? Javier Pena and Steve Murphy? Those the TA no, guys? No, no. Oh, okay, but, I didn't uh, know. But uh, I was in the, the, the joint uh, tactical shop for Colombia, Venezuela, and uh, Pablo Escobar, he had to talk to his family and NSA, of course, working as they do in conjunction with everybody else. When he was talking on the phone, finally enough times in a long, long enough time, that's what, that's what got him uh, killed. And uh, one thing I can say that I've always told people that my little, one of my little claims to fame is that I knew that Pablo Escobar was dead 11 minutes before CNN knew he was dead. And that was pretty cool. Mm. <laughs> yeah, that would be wild. That'd be wild. I, I was tipped that Prince Philip died about twenty minutes before it was announced. Okay, yeah. <laughs> that, uh, but uh, but you know the uh, the, the thing about uh, uh, 
uh, Pablo Escobar and Saddam Hussein. It's human nature is human nature. Oh, sure. And if you study human nature, that's why as an old guy, sometimes I, I used to think that maybe I, maybe I don't relate anymore. But human nature is the same, always has been. Cross culture, doesn't matter. Food, shelter, hope, dreams, all those things are alive in everybody. And if you study human nature and you need to find out information from people, that's will that'll connect. I hope that, that addressed what the, 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 oh, the question was. Absolutely. Now to get on to um, some of the questions, I, I you know I picked out parts of the book to mm -hmm. get ideas and just things that I thought were fun. Uh, you quoted somebody: unque "Undisciplined questioning follows the bouncing ball." Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure if that's what I'm going to be doing this whole interview, but can we discuss that? What you mean by that? Well, uh, we, we teach our students uh, in the interrogation classroom setting to to not be distracted by the, the bouncing ball or the shiny object. Because there is a discipline to questioning that will keep you from forgetting where you were or, or jumping away from what you need to jump away from. Uh, if, if I were to take a situation and say, we have a, a uh, uh, an arrest of a, a gentleman who is planting uh, IEDs, you know, mm -hmm. and, and, and I would want to be, I, would, I wouldn't want to know anything about it because discovery is better. That's what your whole concept is. Let's find out what we can find out from somebody without making structure to it. So discovery is, let's let the person tell me what, what's going on. So if I ask him, what were you doing when you were captured? He would say, planning IEDs. Now the first response to most people would be, what, what were the IEDs? Where were the IEDs? How were they tri triggered? Blah, 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 blah. That's not the, that's the, those aren't the next questions. The next question is, what else were you doing when you were captured? He says, uh, reconnaissance. What do you think the next question is? What else? Absolutely. That, and Absolutely. to interrupt, that that was one of the, every book, if I could take one concept away from a book, mm -hmm. you know, that sticks with me, I'm happy with a book. What else was profound to me? Because I think of questioning in terms of digging, but that was more of a side to side, if that makes sense. Like, uh, you know, in following a path, like you, you, um, I asked one question, and then I asked a deeper or more probing, a deeper and a more probing. Mm -hmm. I never thought of the no, 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 no. You, you got to cast your net wider, as you described. Of, yes. You're doing blah, blah, blah. What else? What else? So it's like you're saying, yeah. here, let me get a wide list of everything we're going to cover. Then you start to dig. I never thought of that. That's exactly it. And, and you know, uh, but, but because it's sexy to think IED, my gosh, now we're going to, and of course, it's important to get all that information. But we'll, if you if you went to that first thing, chances are you won't get the next thing. So you want to get all that up front and then I say put it in your view and then talk about each one individually and, and exploit it completely. So that if I'm asking you what kind of weapons you have, Eric, uh, maybe you have weapons, I don't know, but what kind of weapons do you have? Very few. Okay, uh, that's, that's fine. What's one of those weapons? Um, you can make this up. My cooking. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, I, I shouldn't do more that. But, uh, but, 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 but if I've learned, I've, I've tried to teach the students, you know, when they'd say I, I had, uh, you know, uh, uh, a Glock. What else? What other sure. weapons do you have? Uh, I have a shotgun. I won't ask them what kind of Glock. I won't ask them what kind of shotgun until I get all the weapons they've got. Until they say, that's all I've got. Then I'm not, and then I'm, then I start the questioning about the Glock. I'm start the question about the shotgun. Start the question about anything else they had, because you 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 don't naturally go back to where you were after you've exploited something. You've used most people will keep following that trail. So I'm trying to stop people from doing that and and getting the, the broad vision. Does that relax people too? I mean, because well, for example, when you say what what were you doing? Planning IEDs. They know that everybody wants to know what that. But then when you say what else, does that kind of like, huh? 
it, it takes them a little longer. Well, I was on, okay. I was also doing this. What else? What else? What else? Then you go back, you know, kind of like spreading the wealth and maybe. Well, like, um, hey, I, I've had, I've asked students it. who've come back where they've gone places I haven't gone. They've done things I haven't done, but they, when they come back, I said, did what we tell you and what do we teach you to work? And I had one student tell me, he said, absolutely. He says, when I kept asking what else, what else? He said he got so much information. And when he talked to the gentleman later, he said, I just told you because I, you, you asked me what else as if you already knew. And he <laughs> did, but that's helped him to find out. So it, it's amazing how simple it is to ask good questions, to get good results. Uh, the, the, the book I wrote as a, with, uh, with uh, Marianne, Marianne Carinch, I, you know of her because Greg also wrote with her. Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, find out anything from anyone anytime isn't it about secrets of interrogation it isn't about it isn't about uh, uh you know great techniques it's about great questioning because people when they are comfortable with the conversation and, and questioning should be conversational your first uh, question you ask how did you, sure. it should be should be not direct and abrupt but conversational when i ask what else what other i'd say well you, you said you had a, a pistol and a shotgun uh, I've got those too. What other weapons do you have? Just a little conversational jab in there okay, so to to make maybe it change it up to make say, it oh, anything a else? Pro kind of thing, you know. So that uh, okay. it, it's really just just that that simple to me. I, I have a formula. If you want to share that with your your uh, audience, yeah, please. Uh, and, and I'm going to put it up on paper. You know, I'm I'm an analog kind of guy. You know, paper and pencil All right. work for me. It, it works. And uh, this is this is my formula uh, for effective questioning. Oh, and I think I know what it breaks down to. That's the two by six. That isn't that the who, what, where, when, why, and how. And sometimes well, the, huh? the two is going to be go back to when you were two years old. You were born mm. an interrogator. You were born in a questioner, and you, that was your purest interrogator skills when you were two years old. And, and if you'll allow me to put you on the spot. Okay. Sure. Eric, when you were two years old, where were you living? Tucson, Arizona. Okay. Imagine you're going to the mall in at December, and you see this person you've never seen before in your life, but he's wearing a red big suit, got a white beard hat with a little mm -hmm. dangling thing there, big black belt, black boots. You've never seen this guy before. What's your question? Mm -hmm. Who's that? Absolutely. As a child, that's the first question. Come, and it's just a who's that? Simple question. Santa Claus. And he's coming to your house. What's your next question? Um, is he coming? Uh, I'm sorry. He's is coming that... to your house. And that make he this is? Question. Why? And you said? Why? Why? To give you presents. What kind? <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Natural question. Now I say, but he's only coming on one special night of the year. Well, why is that? Okay, now I got to do push-ups. But uh, what what <laughs> night is that? What night is huh? that? It, 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 the, the next oh. question. What night is that? And then I say it's Christmas Eve. And guess what? He's going to every kid's house in the whole wide world on one special night to give him presents. And he's going to go to every kid's house that night. And your question is, how's he going to do that? Don't feel bad. My parents, I drove them insane. <laughs> and I still drive people insane. My wife calls me why boy. Okay. So I'm wired <laughs> to just ask why all yeah. the time. Well, because so that's, that's important. If anytime you find out why, you find You're right. the, the motive. Okay. So that, that, that's to be as to be honored and and uh, certainly I wouldn't dash that. But that's what happened when we were kids. We asked so many good questions that our parents said, "Would you quit asking so many questions?" And then we did it. And oh, then sure. of course we got to be eighteen. We knew everything. Never asked any more questions. But if you go back to when you were two years old, and then add the interrogatives, those that's the six: who, what, where, when, how, and why. And then I always had the marine uh, interrogative, which is, huh? <laughs> and, uh, which I, I like that um, because some of what you're doing 
is more than just asking a question. Some of it is persuasion and influence. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And when, when you're saying, huh, you're putting yourself at a lower station yeah. and allowing them to own the space. To, to, to come so up with there's, Let me tell you about that. Yeah, there's, sure. you know, there's something there to honor. I'm just saying, huh? Oh, <laughs> what? Now, now I'm learning. And, you know, what, what is it? Carnegie says that nothing sounds sweeter to a person than their own name. No, you, yes. We all have that. We, we, if we just talk about their name. Every time I go to the store, I look for their name. And whenever I'm done checking on stuff, I always say thank you, whatever the name is. And and then I also then also give them the day off. I said you can go home now because I'm done. And for that little <laughs> second, it sounds good, you know. And uh, but uh, but yeah, the, the 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 human connection is great. There's and, and so when you're two years old, you ask good questions: who, what, where, when, how, and why. That's those every question that's a good question starts with one of those words. Doesn't mean it's going to end up a good question. But it has to start with one of those to be a good question. And then we'll see what happens after that. But uh, so with those six, and then the over F, that's the follow-up. Who else, what else, why else, when else? Those are the follow-up questions, uh, the F. And then it's I somebody to... in the chat. Say again? Hold on. Somebody in the chat just brought up an interesting point. Okay. Uh, Jeremy Cat Studio is saying, I learned therapists shouldn't ask why, but rather how. Why can make people feel defensive? Well, I, I'm, we're, we're, we're not coming from that environment necessarily, and I'm sure that that's probably true. Uh, but when we're coming from discovery questioning, from facts and figures, uh, places and names, uh, those questions work well. Um, but the, but it's certainly elicitation is better than questioning. I, I, I've taught questioning for years and years and years, but I very seldom question. I elicit like crazy. I make statements and I get people to say things to me and respond to me without me asking them a question because they, they could always can be a put off, especially if you don't know the person. But I engage everybody. And my girls uh, still at home say, Dad, do you have to talk to everybody? I said, yeah, you know, and I do. <laughs> but I find out things. Well, here's the thing, Eric. What do you know that I don't know that I wouldn't know if I didn't ask? What do I know that you don't know that you wouldn't know if you didn't ask. So we have to have this conversation. And so I know people sure. everywhere know things that I don't know and I want to find out. That's where the book came from. Find out anything from anybody anytime. I wanted to call the book How to Know Everything About Anything Without Knowing Nothing. But they didn't like that for a title. Uh, but uh, that's really what I going to work with. You had a co-author who probably is good in grammar and said, okay, no. <laughs> no, we won't have that. <laughs> but uh, but that's, really, that's, 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 that's how I work. I, I try not to know it. Larry King, you, I'm dating myself now because most people don't, aren't. Not at all. Larry, I, Larry I read King his book. wasn't the best questioner by my standard, by my grid. Mm -hmm. But the one thing he did the best was he never researched the people he was going to interview. He let that happen during the interview. He looked, and that's what you do. And that's, that's my greatest salute to Larry King was that he let us discover with him instead of knowing everything about the person or knowing everything about the, the circumstance. And so he was, Larry he was King, great that way. Larry King has one of my favorite quotes, which actually wasn't his quote. It was his friend's quote. who mm -hmm. said, you know, Larry, the reason why you're good at what you do is you're dumb. <laughs> yeah. And you yeah. just ask the dumb questions that we all want to know. And, he, and yeah. he's right. And what is that? A two-year-old. Yes, absolutely. I, I, I love it. Uh, I'm going to recommend a book to folks. Don't buy my book, but buy this book. No, uh, no, Brian, no. Buy his Brian, Brian Grazer, A Curious Mind. Oh, that's a good book too. It is a I've great, read that. It, it, it put me on the floor with the, 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 with how I felt connected to what he thought and how he thought and how he did what he did. I really, mm -hmm. really was, uh, excited when I read that book. I couldn't quit reading it. And I read it more often now than any other book just to get the best out of it that I've missed the first really? time. No, that that is a that is a great, great book. Surprising book. You don't necessarily know where it's going. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. He's Ron Howard's partner in yeah. uh yeah. making films. So and the way he did it too, his little lunches every day with everybody in the yeah. world. It's 
Yeah. Let, he, let I know he's you probably guy. your dream person to sit down with. Yeah. I want to, I want to grow up and be just like him. <laughs> well, perfect. Now I, I want to get into tactics a, a little bit if we can. One thing that stood out to me is a lot of the book is very, very open-ended, mm -hmm. but like when you were using a training example of Dana, um, Dana Kipatrick, the goal was to obtain a particular piece of information, but that information was known. Now, do you tackle yourself questioning when you have a known outcome that you are seeking differently than if you have an unknown outcome? Uh, and does that make sense? What I'm yeah, yeah I, I, I'm going back in the book where you're remembering that. And uh, I was being interviewed by a person who, who, was unaware that they were part of the the play and uh, oh, okay. and uh, what what the 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 aspect in interrogation uh, from that experience is that if you know something to be a fact proven by intelligence uh, by uh, sight on target those kind of things if you know something to be a fact and you ask a question of that individual who would know that, that would be a, a a question that would be that would verify their credibility. So if they gave you a different answer, oh, then they're using deception. They're using, they're deflecting. They're they're okay. they're. So then you know what you've got. You're you're not a, got a cooperative source. But if you ask that question, you know the answer of it already, and they give you that answer, then you have confidence in them as a source, as a cooperative source for the time of. That, that you're talking. So known information plays a part and discovery plays a part. Everything plays a part. <laughs> that's, that's, a, that's a simple answer to that, I guess. Okay, interesting. And we're, now in interrogation, because this is a technique. So I imagine sometimes you'll reveal something you know and other times you won't just because you maybe you want to imply that you know more than you do mm -hmm. without bluffing you know so right. like you mentioned what else what else what else can be interpreted as uh oh they know everything mm -hmm. but you never said you knew everything so you're not lying right. you're not right. you're not getting caught in a lie or a bluff which right. i'm guessing could backfire on yeah, you yeah yeah if, if you if you get caught in a lie you you've lost your you've lost ground and it's not worth it uh you know the old adage of being recruited in the army. You know that my my recruiter lied to me. Well, mine didn't lie to me, but there's questions I wish I'd asked. <laughs> but uh, but uh, but but yeah, if you, if you if you've tried to make statements that aren't true, and you try to support th something that they know not to be true, then you lose that credibility. You lose that cooperativeness, and so it really is a dance. You got to dangle a little out there, and they got to give some back. And, and, and it is real dance. Hans Scharf is the uh, interrogator of, of World War II. Yep. He is the, the artisan of artisans, and, and he used great uh, techniques in, in, in just human exchange and in caring for people and, and letting down the, the guard. But the interrogation never stops, but the, the, the guards come down. And then one little thing that most people aren't aware of is that if they go to uh, Disney World and the Princess Castle, mm -hmm. and they walk through that Princess Castle from, from the main street to the uh, Fantasyland, all of the murals on both sides of that castle and that little passageway were made by Hans Scharf. Uh, they're, they're, they're a, the mosaic glass. And he did all of those. Mm. And that's not your typical interrogator talent. Well, but, but that, that goes back to the question that was asked on locals. He has that varied experience. And I know it came up too, mm -hmm. where he asked somebody um, a question and they said some BS response about the train. And he was like, no, I used to take that train all the time because of a particular job, you yeah. know, and so we knew, okay, they're lying to me because that's something I did. Yeah. So having a rich life experience, I imagine would help you. And yes. oddly enough, selling uh, graves would mean you're probably going to meet a wide stratum of people, everyone from a carpenter to a movie star. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
and get an idea or an impression of each. Is that fair? Sure, absolutely. Um, now, I've been blessed with a good forgetter, and I had something I was going to say, and uh, I've forgotten what it is now. If I remember it, I'll, I'll bring it back up again. But uh, but we were I was following along there, and it came and went, so we'll uh, move on. But uh, how much time do we still have? I, what? Time is flying by. I, I'm oh, sure. no, don't worry. So, okay. about 20 something minutes. Okay, okay, okay. I, we got, we got, we, we're, we're going, we're getting it. Trust me. <laughs> and uh, because, you know, it's always about me. So I, I get to learn about what I'm doing. And yeah, yeah. You, you have a half hour to get me all straight. I know you normally take a week, but with your experience, well, uh, you're going to have me fixed. I, I've turned 40 hours into four hours. There we go. With, with that formula. Uh, because see, the other, the last piece of that is it's two plus six over F follow up times four. Mm. And there's only four things in the world to talk about. It's as simple as that. Most people think there's, oh, I don't know what to talk about. Well, there's only four things to talk about people, places, things, and events in time. Mm. Everything connects with all of those, everything isolates to one of those. And if you can't think of what to talk about, fall back to those four areas and then pick one and start from there. And uh, I like that. that that's, the, that's the final part of the formula that makes good for good, effective discovery questioning. I like that. Now, one thing I, I mentioned the what else as a profound thing I took mm -hmm. from the book. Um, another one is one that has me second guessing myself like crazy now because I don't know if I'm actually doing compound questions or you know asking multiple questions at one time mm -hmm. or I'm doing a journalistic double dip or I'm framing so now I've just compounded three things into one thing but it is an overall simple concept of asking questions yeah. so can we discuss this in components and starting with what is a journalistic double dip? Uh, if you listen to any any uh, White House briefing, the double dip is when the the the, the, the journalist the reporter gets his chance to ask a question. It's his moment to be in the spotlight, and he wants to take full advantage of it. So he'll ask the question, he'll ask the follow up question, and he'll even ask another question before they tell him, "Okay, we're done." You know. But the, 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 and that is, instead of just asking the question and waiting for the response, they want to throw one more in there or two more in there. And so that's the double dip. So he may ask, um, were you there that night? And while you were, if you were there, did you see anybody? Yeah. And who did you see? And just, just trailer okay. right on down. And that's three different questions. Mm -hmm. And those should be isolated. It, now it depends on the circumstance. If you're, if you're a lawyer, that's a different questioning because that's, that's not about discovery. That's about proving a point. And so I, uh, I, I, I differentiate from lawyers anything that I do because they're, they're, they're not discovery in court. They're, they're trying to eliminate information and only isolate information. So they don't count. And testify too. Yes. They're speaking in testimony at the same <laughs> time when they're doing that. Yeah, and I, I, I learned that lesson once I was in court uh, and then I was being uh, asked to provide additional money. I was being asked to provide a uh, follow on education. And I was also being asked to pay for the lawyer who's trying to get all this from me. And I dressed up like a lawyer and this person's lawyer thought I was a lawyer. And we talked about the case for a while. So he found out who I was and then oh. that was, we were done. But, but during that trial, uh, I didn't know, but since he put that person on the stand, the judge said, well, what are your questions for this person? I didn't know I was going to get to ask questions. The first thing I told myself was yes and no, no open ended questions. And I framed mm -hmm. my questions well with only a yes or no response required. And at the end of that, that uh, particular situation, I didn't pay for the lawyer. I didn't pay for additional funding. I didn't pay for anything else. As a matter of fact, the funding I was providing was suspended. So I, I, I won everything that I countered with. But the important thing was is when it, my time to question, I, I went against everything I normally do because the, it, the, the courtroom questioning is, a, is, a, is not discovery. 
It's not about information. It's about information isolation. But uh, so there's there's part of the difference. But framing the question, that's what you do. That's what you just did right there. Even though you, you, you talked about the three questions, you weren't asking those three questions. You were using those as examples of what framing and those other things would be. So I think you understand framing to be, instead of asking, do you know anything about uh, the accident? You would ask, what do you know about the accident? You know, we know that there was an accident. You might have been present. What did you see? That's a frame. Okay. A little bit of, uh, uh, it'll, you know, just, just to give a connection to the event or to the well, person. Focus, maybe. And then, yeah, and say, okay, this is what we're going to talk about. And then the question. Introduce okay. the subject. Yeah, that's framing introduces that subject. And you do Perfect. that well. Oh, good. I, I feared that. Oh, no. Like, I, I'm making this, and I'm like, am I doing the double or triple or <laughs> actually? And that, and then you kept going in the book and you talk about framing. Like, well, maybe I'm framing. So let me cling to that lifeline. You are. You are. <laughs> really yeah. Okay. Can we talk about, because this is really cool, um, the electronic language simulator? What is this? Uh, well, that's, that's when I was a kid at 10 years old, I was paid a penny of paper to stamp patent pending on this particular product. This man made it a, it a body shop that he was patenting. And I was paid a penny a page to stamp patent pending with a, with an ink stamper, you know, I did hundreds of them to make money, you know, for mostly for candy and anything else. But I cool. thought to myself one of these days, would I ever invent anything? And damned if I didn't. Uh, when I worked at Phoenix Consulting Group, I, when I cut out of the Army in 2004, I came to D.C. and got to work with the Phoenix Consulting Group. And we were teaching human intelligence collection uh, from the get-go, straight up. And uh, most of our contracts were the Defense Intelligence Agency. And uh, we were using linguists to be interpreters for our students who were doing interrogation in language. So that we would have to hire two linguists, one, both of them at the same language level, which is a very expensive proposition because uh, you pay for per diem, you pay for hours work, you're paying for food, all of that. Mm. Sometimes hotel rooms, it's very, very costly. So in business, if you save money, you've made money. Sure. And I used to be in radio Back in the good old days when times were bad, WBCE, Wycliffe, Kentucky, handsome Jimmy James, Owen Paul Esquire, just another pretty face wasted on radio. But uh, <laughs> but I had this idea that was inspired by Charlie Brown. Well, I, well. <laughs> well, well, well. So instead of having actual language to be the complicator, if it's Arabic or Spanish, and the, the Army taught me both of those languages at Defense Language Institute in Monterey, California. And I will tell you, I've never done anything harder in my life for 68 weeks to try to learn uh, Arabic. Eric, uh, Greg Hartley retained his. Mine became Arabic and Spanish became Spiravic, and it's all a mess up here. <laughs> I was wondering okay. if it's a variant of Spanglish. <laughs> <laughs> but... Uh, but anyway, so that it, so that I said to myself, if we could eliminate the the cost of these two people with a few little electronic gizmos, we mm -hmm. might uh, might do well. And so I put together a device that creates the same kind of concept. Uh, womp, womp, womp. We don't we know what they're talking. We know they're talking, and it was in real time, and it was it, it was it would change what you're saying to a non discernible, understandable language and we use the machine instead of an interpreter or a linguist and even the students could operate the machine and learn how difficult it is to be an interpreter between two people and so it's a it's a language simulator we use headphones and microphones and we isolate each person the when i talk to you if you're on the machine you don't understand me when you talk to me i don't understand you but because we're both speaking english we can have an English interpreter. He hears us both and talks to us. And so when the interpreter talks to me, you don't understand him. When the interpreter talks to you, I don't understand him. But it's just like the real situation. So there would be three people yes. involved still. Yes. 
you would have just three people all speaking English, mm -hmm. just so I understand this, and two can't hear each other. They're isolated through some mechanism. Can't understand each other. Well, that's what I'm saying. Uh, yeah. You're sorry. There's no other. Like if I take out the headphones, I'd hear you say something, right? Right. So the headphones isolate me mm -hmm. from that. But the third person, because I'm guessing using a soundboard of some kind, is hearing both sides yes. in English. And so he he just toggles between the two, and, and it sounds like he's talking in that language that you don't understand, even though it's English. And so we 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 got a patent for the electronic language simulator. It's, it was fully patented. Uncontested patent. Nice. Uncontested patent. I'm the inventor. It's their intellectual property, but I got great satisfaction of saying I, I made a difference. We sold them to the uh, to the uh, Navy SEALs in Coronado Island, down in Little Creek. We sold them to Fort Huachuca to the Strategic Brief Course, and um, they worked. Do you have a? Do you have one? Yeah, <laughs> I'd want one. Okay. I, hate it. I, want, I want my yeah. toy. <laughs> and, and, and and guess what? It's all from off the shelf stuff, used oh, contrary to what the purpose was. So that the, the, the secret is how 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 I conform them and use them because it's all contrary <laughs> to what the normal function would be. And you would be surprised how how effective it was and how simple it was. And it just took a year and a half to of losing sleep night after night to get to that point. And uh, oh, I'm, no. I'm very proud of that. Thank you for asking. Right, and, and you should be. I, I have a question for you on that, especially dealing with the translator and formulating questions to someone in a different culture or language. Mm -hmm. How do you mitigate the interpretation or language ability of the interpreter to the other person as in are they actually translating clearly or interpreting what you're saying correctly and relaying that over correctly mm -hmm. well there's several ways that you, you get confidence one of them is to have somebody who speaks that language be your 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 driver <laughs> you know mm -hmm. you're just there and he's listening, and you're unaware that he's aware. So, uh, mm. so the interpreter then is being evaluated by somebody he's not aware of evaluating. So that's one of the ways. Uh, of course, we have uh, a lot of uh, recording capabilities, audio, video, and, and such. And sometimes we can take capture that and then have that checked for, for veracity. One okay. of the great uh, videos from the Vietnam War era, black and white, uh, was, was an interrogation. And the the interpreter was telling the person, instead of saying, you know, we're coming to your village to, to help you and to protect you, he's, the interpreter is actually saying to this villager, if you say anything, I'll kill your family. Mm. And the person, of course, that they were talking didn't understand the language. And so they, he said, you just nod and smile. <laughs> but then mm. when that, this came back and was reviewed years later, that's that was the circumstance. So without that, though, what I'm looking for audibly and, and visually is for the question that I ask, is this big? And then they ask the question, if it's this big, I have to wonder, is that because of culture? Is that because of language? Or is it because he's adding something to it? So I will I will look for variants, and if they become too constant, I will be suspect. If I if I if, if the person you can't see my hands here if they're way out, the person gives right. a little big long answer, and then he just says, "Well, he said that." I don't like that. I, I want that I want that information that was this big to kind of be that much this big coming back. So the variations in the the, the the amount of time, the amount of words are indicators sometimes if uh, the veracity is in question. And so okay. we just have to to trust that our, our, our linguists who are hired and inter interpreters are hired are, are, are good. We evaluate them as best we can. And then I look for the little changes in the 
in the source. If, uh, if all of a sudden he, he's, he's, he's kind of down and I, 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 and I didn't say anything that should make him feel, you know, that away, then I'm mm. wondering if something was said. So uh, again, we're looking for body language. We're looking for audible uh, cues uh, much more than what we could go into here. But that, those are the things that, that, uh, and, and of course, that's the thing why questioning is so important using an interpreter, because the more you ask a compound question, the more you ask a too big a question, the more you have confusion and possible complications. So simple questions, what's your name? Where are you from? What, what do you do? What else do you do? Those things keep the questions just like that. And you, you have a better, better uh, input. Oh, that's uh, that's fascinating. Now, I, I, um, I don't know if the the correct term for it. It's like a simultaneous interpreter or or concurrent interpreter. I've had uh, mm -hmm. Christina Lennon on, and she's a hypnotist, mm -hmm. and she'll go to like China and hypnotize people there. She doesn't speak Chinese at all, or mm -hmm. Germany, or whatever. She makes it a point of asking for simultaneous interpreters and these people are spooky scary and i didn't know if you've ever dealt with one where they're speaking with her like a half of second behind almost like their mind melded to her just Crazy. spitting out everything she's saying mm -hmm. in that foreign language have you ever had the opportunity to work with anyone like that i'm just curious uh i i don't recommend that uh again from experience and from our environment because uh, my parents lived in Southern California when they lived there, Twin Nine Palms. When I would go visit them in their old age, they couldn't hear you very well. So they talked to me at the same time. And mm. anytime you hear two voices coming, it is oh. very complicating. So uh, if you have your voice and another voice in a different language going at the same time, it's even disconcerting to the, the questioner. So we okay. recommend, I recommend, I won't say we, I recommend the alternating if there's time. Now, sometimes alternating mm -hmm. takes a long, doesn't take twice as long to use an interpreter. It takes three times as long because mm. you go from the question yeah. to the interpreter who has to think in the language, who has to say the question, who has to listen to the question, has to answer the question back to this person in language, change it in language and back to me. It takes so much longer. So that's why it needs to be simple, quick, and not uh, not at all. Uh, you know, it, it just needs keep it simple. Keep it simple. Well, you you learned Arabic and Spanish, and did you still use interpreters? And just knowing the language helped we, you. We always use interpreters to... where where you know, the seldom would anybody ever be in language. Um, mm. That that's that's that. That, that degree of language that is taught at, at, at DLI is just a basic. Even after 60 okay. weeks, just a basic. And so you understand if the, the source says, uh, if I say, what kind of, uh, um, you know, what automatic weapons did you have? And he says, uh, uh, no, I've, I've forgotten the word now for, for fried chicken. But if he says food instead of munitions. Okay. So the, yeah, it's we, just we, a little check. Yeah. So 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 sometimes it's the, the context is what we're looking for, and the dejaj meshui, you know, fried chicken. Okay. So uh, that was the word I was looking for. But uh, anyway, uh, it's, it's 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 because of of uh, of dialect and those kind of things. It's almost impossible to learn that without being native speaker. So it's just an enhancement. And it's, 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 you know, it's, we're not trained to do that without an interpreter. Okay. And that's what I was wondering if it was just kind of like a, a sanity check where oh, yeah. you can get a feel for the rhythm and mm -hmm, mm -hmm. what uh, other language and if should, everything should be hearing this should be hearing that. Sure. And then you probably get better as you go just because of exposure. Oh, and of course, some people, if, they, if, they, if they're in country for years, sure, that's a different environment. And that's a different experience, but uh, uh, we, we, right, well, take, we take young people uh, straight off the street, and uh, which is a hard challenge to make them interrogators because they don't have the the, the the street smarts at a young age, but they they have the, the basics to work with and with the language, and it all starts there. It, it has to grow. It has to be uh, fed and, and, and nurtured.
Okay, I have a crazy question from the chat, which I don't know if it's a joke or a question, but hi, Eric Hunley. Hi, Jim. Jim, if you had two exact clones of yourself and one had to interrogate interrogate of the other, the other had to withhold information, which one would succeed? A you versus you situation. Well, you know a lot about body language guys. You know, Greg and Scott and Mark Bowden and those guys. Um, mm -hmm. I can read body language, but I can't hide it. So I've my body language mm. would be the biggest giveaway right away. Uh, but if I'm interrogating me, um, the handsome one would win, as opposed to this one. And uh, okay, because I've got a handsome one in there somewhere. And uh, but uh, no, that 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 that's, is a crazy question. I've never been asked that question before. Uh, I, I think that uh, uh, wow. Nope, I, that's that's new thought to me. <laughs> that's meta. Um, okay, as a last question, and this is kind of observational, just I'm curious if you agree philosophically, but in constructing Eduardo, a character that you created for people to interrogate. Yeah, yeah, okay, uh, the, in Cuba. Um, you talked about essentially what a lot of actors do and that's developing their character saying you know who am i where was i born uh what do i believe in what does this come from you know things that you built a biography for yourself mm -hmm. what are your thoughts on this being reverse engineered for investigation well what what's the movie uh the the usual suspects Mm -hmm. Where was isn't that where uh, uh, the, the the guy developed the story all along the movie? And he, he he was uh, uh, so say what's the yeah I I've been through something I can't follow through with, but uh, with that uh, the that's that's what we we train our our, our special forces and guys to do. To become somebody else, to disguise their information, to to withhold the fact. Uh, if you were if you were from uh, Hampton, and or mm -hmm. up here living right next door to the CIA headquarters, you would never want that to be part of your story. You'd want to be from somewhere else, so that people mm -hmm. don't suspect uh, association. But uh, <laughs> pardon me for that. Uh, we'll kill that. Um, but uh, I, when Greg Hartley and I both taught at the uh, resistance lab at the uh, Fort Bragg at Camp McCall, and they have a constructed uh, uh, prisoner war camp, and the, 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 the trainees are put through hell for a week and a half before they end up there. And I was, I was proud to say that I was part of the very first interrogation support for that brand new facility back in 1986. We hmm. opened it up fresh new and uh, we were interrogators. Now we, we had, we had warm showers, color TV and beds, and we never locked, lacked for food and sleep. And those poor guys day and night. <laughs> and so their stories that they were not strong stories, they would, they would fall apart in front of us after we talked oh. to them for a while without and questioned them and, and use strong issues without breaking them. We, we took them to the limits always, but didn't break them. We had psychologists watching all the time to protect them and us from them. But uh, we, we, we tested their, their, their metal and that was what they were there for. But I had one student who told me he was from Southern Illinois and we talked about Southern Illinois because I'm from Southern Illinois. And mm. we talked about Southern Illinois. And we talked about Collinsville, Illinois. And I said, you know, I, I've been through there. And dang, if I when I was a kid, my dad used to say, look at that. Look at that. He said, you mean the ketchup tower? Yeah. And the Brooks Ketchup Company has a big water tower. looks like a ketchup bottle. Mm. And I was convinced that he was from Collinsville, Illinois, Southern Illinois, his experience, everything he said worked for me. And he was not. Wow. He was not. 
And so my experience and my knowledge was 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 fooled. And that that means that he had really, really done his background well, because it, it it's 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 usually about two feet deep, and usually we go about seven feet deep. So uh, it, it it's what we're up against as an interrogator. People resist. Mm. People don't want to tell. They're told not to tell what they know, who they are, where they're going, what the mission is. But uh, to get the cooperation, to get the information, takes the skill set, and the questioning is a part of that. And um, I encourage your listeners to ask good questions. Just be curious like a kid. Four subjects, people, places, things, events, and time. That's all there is to it. Well, fantastic. And everybody, the book is Find Out Anything from Anyone, Anytime. And Jim, thank you so much. Thank you for having me. And uh, hope the your listeners uh, take something away from here that uh, helps them day to day. You don't have to be an interrogator. This this works everything, everywhere, anytime. Sure. All right. Definitely. Great.